I really think what was going on there was that Steven was like, you know what, one of these dinosaur movies is going to hit. I don't know which one, but I'm going to try a whole bunch of them. Let's try Land Before Time. Let's try We're Back. Let's try Jurassic Park. Yeah, and I think that he's just, I think he's like, wow, you know what? If you take the singing and dancing and all that shit out and just make them, I don't know, kill and eat people, <laughs> they really like it. Yeah, they, they seem to like that part of it a lot more. For some reason. I want to say Land Before Time. I want to say that one did all right. But I know that We're Back, it was one of those movies, thinking back, like, I liked it when I was a kid, but now that I was thinking back on it, like, no, I'm pretty sure that movie's probably kind of shitty, if I had to guess. I don't know. I, don't, I think back on it, I don't smile. You know, the last time I remember watching We're Back is I got it on VHS somewhere, somewhere along the lines. God, it, it had been like 10 years plus ago, so I, I don't know. See, that that would be a great uh, commentary episode to try out at some point. I remember the whole thing where the kids, like, for some reason there's a guy, there's a man who has a scary circus. He's like, I want dinosaurs, but we're dinosaurs and we like people. Well, we want you to be evil or I'm going to turn these kids into fucking monkeys. Like, okay, well, we'll be evil dinosaurs. The kids turn back into people and they got to go face the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs are like, we remember feelings and hot dogs. <laughs> In New York and Woody Allen pictures. Like, oh, okay, here's those dinosaurs again. Remembering. <laughs> they were probably all, like, voiced by huge 90 stars at the time, if I had to guess. I don't even remember, but, yeah. So, somebody like that. I don't know, but, um... John Goodman. I'm just going on a limb. John Goodman probably voiced one of them. Possibly the T-Rex. But I'm just going to assume John Goodman voiced the dinosaur in that movie. It, it could have been. For, for all I, we know. You know, as I said, like, the only thing I can remember... Roseanne was popular back then. Well, yeah, that was like that was like the prime time of Roseanne because I think we're back's 1992. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, those, those like you know Steven Spielberg's like you know what some dinosaur movie's gonna fucking work. I don't know which one. Oh, well, guess what? The one I directed did, but uh, shit, you know what I mean? I try some other ones out too at the same time. I'm gonna ride this dino wave. I think he he just goes through his moods where he for a while like you know I want to do a lot of World War Two shit. I mean I'm gonna direct a couple World War Two movies and then I'm gonna produce a lot of World War Two stuff. Like, just uh, threw my name on it. Band of Brothers and all that kind of stuff, too. Yeah, or, like, I mean, you know, I'm kind of into space shit right now, so I'm going to direct Apollo 13 and then produce some more space shit. And then later, you just kind of, like, I, I kind of know, like, what, what, like I, for I a thought, while. I thought uh, Ron Howard did Apollo 13. Did he do? Maybe that's all Ron Howard did. I, I think that also pro seems like a Steven probably produced it. You know, you know Steven, Ron, mm -hmm. they're all, George, they're all in the same boat. Yeah, and I could also see there's a period where Steven Spielberg's like, you know what I really am in the mood for? Classic cartoon shit. So I'm going to produce Animaniacs, I'll produce maybe Brainiac, and yeah, okay, and then maybe, you know, maybe, like, that's probably around when he was producing some of the, um, um, uh, Don Bluth movies, too. No, oh, yeah, well, I, yeah, I think it's just Steven got to a point where he just had so much money, he's like, I could do whatever I fucking want. I always wanted to see this happen, throw some money at it. Always like this idea. Just... Throw some money at it. Like, take that Indiana <laughs> Jones credit. He's just driving down. He just sees a director or like a filmmaker he likes. Just chucks a lot of money at him. <laughs> it's like a suitcase. And he just, just says like flying through the air. Just smacks him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Steven was being a fucking dick by throwing that at me. But then I was then I realized it was a suitcase of money. It's like, well, shit. I mean. I know there's. I know he just didn't give this to me, so yeah, I, I guess said, I gotta. That, well, I guess I gotta make a singing dinosaur, dinosaur movie. movie now. <laughs> make that fucking dinosaur movie. You, that, that script that you sent me like four years ago. <laughs> what was it called? Like we're What's back. It about? I fucking forgot. And who the fuck cares? Make it. I'm back. Some shit. <laughs> but um, speaking of stuff coming back, back in the New York groove, I guess of all types of fun stuff, they had the Batman Ninja Turtles movie finally came out. Well, first off, Old Man Orange Podcast. I'm Ryan Dunnigan. I'm Spencer Scott Holmes, so that, that's, where, that's where you are if you, in case you got lost. In case this just happened to appear on like one of those radio networks or your podcast player on Spotify was just going on automatic and you just didn't know what the hell was coming up next, and this, this, this is what you got. So, uh, yeah, well, glad you could come aboard. That's what you're in for, folks. Guess what? This train ain't stopping anytime soon. It's, there's no stops here. I just got to keep going. So, yeah, I got the uh, new Batman vs. Ninja Turtles movie out. Which, 
All in all, I mean, like, here's the thing. It's like, they had that comic book that came out, you know, oh, two years ago or something like that. Like, I have all six issues sitting somewhere, but I haven't read it in a while. But that was one of those ones where, like, not only is just the concept itself just totally badass, but the fact that, like, it had, like, this amazing artwork to top it all off in that one. Like, the artwork itself was almost, like, the main selling point, in my opinion, for that book. You know what I mean? It was just, like, so beautiful. It almost had, like, that almost like color and pencil kind of look. I'm not too sure how else you really call it, but that's what it sort of felt, which makes it sound like it's lesser artwork. I'm trying to explain it that way. It makes it sound like it was something someone did in school class, but no, no, no. Like, the way that it was didn't really look like any other book out there. You know what I mean? If, no matter what comic book store you went to, you probably couldn't find another book that had that same similar artwork to it. Well, it's interesting because Ninja Turtles' artwork often looks kind of rough and scratchy, at least going off the original stuff. Mm -hmm. And Batman can kind of go either way. Batman could look very bright and fluid. I mean, usually there's a lot of dark colors, but usually it can go very detailed to very ultra-realistic to very characterish. And this one seems to... I, I think the book itself was only like four issues or something. Maybe it was five. six. It's six. It was six? Uh -huh. Okay. If well, it's... I was flipping through it. It goes by pretty quickly. Even for six issues, it goes... Maybe because there's a lot of fighting. But it's one of those things where the artwork, it looks like it bounces well between the two because it does have this very nice artwork that's just very well detailed. And the coloring, even though it does not feel muted and it does not feel... Um, too grainy it doesn't like it doesn't look like there's like a lack of color like it still pops out but it still looks like it fits the world of batman not being too like dark or anything at the same time yeah exactly i think it's a good like balance because yeah well ninja turtles like especially nowadays can come in like almost any shape or form because you know you got the original mirage comics ones or whatever the black and white gritty ones with ultra like shading and detail into them and then from that point on, then, you know, you get cartoon kind of looks. And then now that they've had so many other different styles from, like, the Nickelodeon one and the TMNT one and so on, like, the books have just kind of changed throughout time. So there's just different looks. I mean, I guess you could say, that, you could say the exact same thing about Batman, too. It's like, yeah, the artist changes, too, throughout time. But um, going into the movie, though, they kind of choose, like, almost like I feel like sort of a Saturday morning cartoon kind of look to it. I mean, it doesn't really look at all like the comp books kind of design at all. Not to say that's a bad thing. I mean, it's animation, so it's going to definitely look different. But what I almost like about it is it has a Saturday morning feel. Like, literally, like, something that you would have saw, like, 15 years ago, like, if you would have tuned on the TV. But, like, it gives it, like, a hard PG-13, which is just an interesting kind of, like, balance. I think it's almost kind of there to throw you off, and I'm surprised they did that because this is still not only just... It's not like they're trying to turn their back on cartoon turtles because they always say the comics are way more darker and way more violent, the original ones at least. But Ninja Turtles now, they've kind of because there's that period where they were they were they never kind of totally went away. They're always there to some extent. And I think when we were in high school, there was that one show. I never watched it, but there was a Team and T show, and that one was well received, but it wasn't huge. But I feel like right now. The new one they have on Nickelodeon, I mean, there's the 2D one, but which just started. But then there's the 3D one, which that one was huge, and people just love that one. I've only seen a few episodes, and what I saw was good. But I feel like they're like, you know, we got to throw Nickelodeon on there, because that's more brand la labeling now. So I was surprised they did some of the things they did this they did in this movie with Nickelodeon's name being attached to it. Because well, because Nickelodeon owns Ninja Turtles now for, like, all, like, the movie rights and, like, the TV rights and so on. So that's the reason why Nickelodeon's still on there. And, um, yeah, it is kind of weird because it's like, yeah, it's like, you know, like, they always say the Mirage comics, like, are, like, they're like, oh, my God. They make it seem feel like it's, like, radically different than, like, the Ninja Turtles show. And it's not that much different, really. The best way to say it is the very first Ninja Turtles live-action movie, that's pretty much about the exact same tone as the... Um, the Mirage comics, maybe just minus down a little bit of like the sort of like 90s-ness, like um, kind of like surfer kind of comedy with like the pizza stuff. That's like the only thing that's not really in the Mirage ones as much, but they're really not that much different though. Like they, like, I don't know, because I've read through a bunch of them because I've really got into like those old Mirage comics and they make these cool special edition ones where after you finish an issue, you get like a big old fatty special feature at the very end and then it keeps going on and on and on. It's totally badass with Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman and all that stuff. But um, it's funny because that first Ninja Turtles movie, and I think we said it before on a podcast or something like that, but that movie, like, does not get enough credit for being, like, super accurate to the comic. I mean, like, that is almost beat for beat the same thing as the comic book is. Where they, they're introduced... 
they get their asses kicked. They got to go out to the cabin and get like Raphael clean or whatever. It just feels like it. Like we can't let Raphael go. He's gonna he's gonna go out back on the street get some dope or some shit. And they come together as a family to fight Shredder at the end. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit more that happens in the comic, of course, because just because it mm-hmm. is a comic book. But I mean, like, that's one of those ones where it's like, dude, it's like, what, it's like for a fact that, that being like one of the first, in a sense, comic book movies ever made. It's one of those ones where it's like, talk about being like super accurate that I, ne- I never really thought about it till like I read those books because it has it's a little bit different than the origin in the cartoon show. You know what I mean? Where, because they have that, they were like, you know, splinters in the cage. He's like, he's like, I watched my master and I trained side by side. And I used to always think that was kind of corny. I'm like, I, I kind of like the origin a little bit more in like the 87 show. Where it's like, oh no, he was a regular human. And then because of the ooze, he turned to the rat and so on. But in the comic book though, that's what the, the origin is. The one where he's the rat in the cage, like throwing punches and shit. So, I mean, if that's the case, I'm like, well, if that was what was in the book, I give him total credit for sticking with that and just saying, nope, here we go. Yeah, yeah. So, um, regarding that, though, it is kind of interesting what you said. It, it does have this weird kind of Saturday morning cartoon, even from the aspect of a Batman story. Because this art style, I mean, it's maybe... I don't think it's meant to take place in the world of the Batman, the uh, um, early 2000s Batman cartoon. But it has kind of that vibe. At least Batgirl kind of looks sort of like that. So does Robin, even though it's obviously Damien and not Dick Grayson. Mm-hmm. Well, then they give like Batgirl a Burnside kind of style, which I think is neat. Cause I have you seen? Has she been in any of these DCU ones yet, or is it? I can't remember if they use that look. I don't yet. think the design of Batgirl from Burnside has been in there, other than a stinger at the end of Batman: Bad Blood. Oh, that's right, that's right. And then I don't think did that ever come back around. But uh, whatever. No, it was kind of like the next one was Killing Joke or whatever. So I think, all right, this is sort of kind of like Batgirl related, but I don't think they ever came back around to Batgirl being part of the team. Maybe the next time they have one of those DC Universe cartoon movies, maybe she'll just be a member of the team without explaining it, which is fine with me. Well, it's kind of weird because I guess that means they haven't done another one of the Batman ones in, in that continuation. They've just done like offshoot Batman ones since then. And that's been a long time now. It's been like two years almost. Weird, weird to think about. Yeah, that. Bad Blood, I think, was the last. I think Bad Blood was the last one that was strictly a Batman one. Yeah, the Batman that continued. There wasn't, there wasn't, uh, the part of the continued story, yeah. Yeah. So it's like in this one here, we get kind of back to like. Well, Batman, the cool thing about this one is Batman has his blue suit on, so it looks like 1970s style Batman, which I feel like is one of those ones, like, I was trying to think about. I'm like, dude, that's t- talk about, like, I don't think I've ever really seen that suit in, like, a, any of the animated ones before. Not in a while. I think Brave and Bold, but not in a oh, while. Yeah, well, I, okay. say wasn't... I guess Brave and the Bold did, but not like, I guess, in the DCU ones. Let's say that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not in that, I don't think. You know. But, um, so, from here, I mean, I'll say this. It's kind of like, in some aspects, it follows the comic pretty closely, but it kind of expands on it. Because the comic, even though it's six issues, I guess, it goes by pretty quickly. And, uh, maybe because there's just so much fighting in it or something like that. But then you uh, watch this, and it's like a full hour and 47 minutes. So it's not like this little hour and 10 minute thing that they they usually do for a while. Lately, they've been like an hour and 20. It's like, okay, they're going up a little bit. This one's a full on hour and 47 minutes. And that's not, that may not sound like a lot for these animated strict DVD movies. It doesn't happen too often. Well, plus too, the thing about an animation movie too is even like in an hour and 10, that probably is about the exact same length as a two hour long live action movie because I think more stuff just happens in an animated one. It's the same thing with like, like a 20 minute episode. Like, I don't know what it is. You can watch a 20 minute episode of a cartoon or watch like a 45 minute episode of like a live action show. I bet you more things will happen in that 20 minute cartoon than in the live action one, weirdly enough. Mm-hmm. And moving forward, so essentially this also makes, this takes some changes from the comic and I don't know which one I like more. We'll go. We'll just go beat for beat here in a minute. But um, I don't know really which one I like more. I think that um, the biggest seller of the comic is the artwork because the artwork is just so good, and it's also it feels like it's maybe tilting a little bit more towards Batman and early Ninja Turtles, just from the way it looks and kind of the tone. Where this one feels like it's leaning more towards Saturday morning cartoon, but at the same time. It throws you a curveball with, oh shit, that's right, it's Gotham City. Things get a little violent here. Yeah. And it's like, I, I think that's kind of how it is. It's like almost like it's got more of the cartoony Ninja Turtles, like not necessarily, I guess you would say, a little bit more serious Ninja Turtles, you know? But 
still having those like dark moments in there and just having people like get brutally killed left and right it's just like oh oh that kind of throws you off now the one thing it is kind of weird though is i will say that some of the ninja turtles have kind of an odd look to them like and it, not all of them but mainly it's i gotta say this it's donatello like what the hell is up with his yeah. head he's got like a tiny head and it's like narrow and skinny it's fucking weird looking be little eyes be as tiny be little eyes too which really just throws me off yeah well you think that being the smarter guy he'd have a bigger head but in this one's like he's got like a tiny head it just it, it's weird looking that's the, that's the only thing is i kind of i don't know what it is everybody kind of wants to do this thing i know it's lately of ninja turtles but they try to make all the ninja turtles look sort of different from each other you know because in the olden days like the only thing that was different from them was the headbands and in the real olden days the only thing that was different from them was the weapons so mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I, maybe that's what I'm just more used to. It's like, I just feel like I'm fine with them all looking kind of the same, just give me a different color. Like, when, when they, whenever they try to make them have, like, too much of a different look from each other, I don't know what it is. It kind of, like, loses it. It's like, oh, uh, it's like, you guys are, like, trying to figure out, like, well, I guess we could change the shape of their heads. Yeah, that, that makes them look a little bit more different. Uh, give one of them bigger fists than the other one. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And then, then you start getting kind of weird looks. Like, I mean, I'll say this. Leo looks fine. Michelangelo looks fine. Raphael, for the most part, does too. I mean, they give him like that super chin. He's like he looks like a Frank Miller character, and I'm fine with that. I actually like Raphael as this big, just fucking angry. Because I want to say, even in the 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 uh, um, CG cartoon, he was kind of bigger. And I want to say he at least had like a chip on his shell or something like that. So you could tell he got into more fights, and he even has like a little bit of a scar on, in this one. Mm -hmm. I, I wish Raphael had a little bit more like more like brooklynish voice and that's been kind of like my complaint like in the last like 10 years is like they've kind of pulled back on his voice like a bit like well, i just love the old-fashioned like hey the turtles here i'm from brooklyn you know i mean i miss those days where he almost sounds like one step away from rocky balboa <laughs> yeah exactly you know what i mean and he's got like a tough and he's got a deeper voice and everything like that where now it's like, in this one, he's got kind of like a kiddie voice. I mean, I know they're teenagers and all and stuff, but I always picture Raphael's like, he's the guy who's been smoking since he's like 10. Even though they say they're teenagers and it's even entitled teenagers, I never think of them as teenagers. I think of them as guys in their early 20s. Because Raphael just seems like a guy who's been working down at the quarry <laughs> since he was like three. Exactly. He's like, like, I paid for fucking Mikey's education and look how far I got him. He goes, he spends it on skateboards and pizzas. <laughs> I only eat pizza because that's the only thing we can fucking afford. And I'm friends with my, I'm friends with Billy down the street who works there. He gives me a discount. He says if I come in late at night, he'll give me all the free ones that people messed up on. You know what I mean? I take those home and that's what we eat for pizza. You know what I mean? It wasn't a choice. It's not that we wanted pizza. It's just that was the only thing available. Even though we get him for free, he spends all his education money on skateboards and fucking pizza. And Bad Brains cassette tapes. <laughs> he even bought a fucking arcade machine and drug it down to the sewer. Can you fucking believe that? All Player 2 didn't even fucking work on it. Where I'll say, well, going going back to this, the two that always look kind of the same relatively is uh, Leo and Michelangelo. They always look about the same, the way you'd expect them to look. Yeah, like they they never seem they they seem to kind of keep them in their like sort of normal state. I mean, like Michelangelo definitely in this one is very like they make him like super like whoa, dude, like I'm super out there more than normal, like almost partially retarded Michelangelo. He's always been that though, but at the same time, I feel. Um, he didn't annoy me at any point, and I thought a lot of his jokes were actually good. Because Michelangelo, not that I dislike him, but he's always been, even as a little kid, he was my least favorite. So, well, um, he's kind of, I, I thought they did a good job of, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, just, I guess continues on with what you said, but um, they, they do, like, a good way of, like, he's still funny without being annoying. Because sometimes that's always the downfall to, like, the comic relief characters. It's like Deadpool. Whenever I notice it's a PG-13 Deadpool, he's fucking annoying. He's not funny, he's annoying. And it's like... There's always that kind of fear there with that. And then also, uh, something what they do with Mikey is he does more of the um, satirical meta humor in this. Like, they... First thing that opens up with, I believe it's Batman stopping... No, no, first, actually, it's Barbara Gordon over at some R&R &R facility. Just as Barbara Gordon, some Foot uh, Clan members attack. She just kind of stealthily moves some people around, tries to get them from getting assassinated. She sees the turtles move through the mist, but she just sees them. I think they're lizard monsters or something like that. And 
They uh, then from there we see Batman stomping the foot and goes up against Shredder. And I thought it was kind of interesting that they elaborated more on dynamics between the two different series because Batman has kind of this rivalry with Shredder because they have a fight early on and Shredder's like, "I am the greatest," and Batman's like, "No, fuck you, I'm the greatest." You know, so it's this whole thing of like, it, there's this whole thing of like that motherfucker thinks he's gonna out judo me. Fuck that guy. He's kind of got a chip guy. on I'm his shoulder. I'm white shoulder. and rich. <laughs> of course I can have judo him. <laughs> Someone didn't tell him what time it is. Alfred, can you believe this? This Japanese guy thinks he's better than me at, like, <laughs> martial arts. Well, sir, I just wanted to point out. Dude, Alfred, don't you dare bring up the fucking white thing again. I'm fucking Jewish, don't you know? I mean, I know I changed my name because, you know, you know how it is. He goes in, says like, what, you never seen Surf Ninjas or Three Ninjas? White guys can punch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, white guys could have like, you know, a Japanese uncle and there's nothing fucking weird about it. No one questions it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, so um, it's one of those things where Batman's like, that motherfucker. Cause, uh, because early on, while he's trying to stop the foot, he does, they, the uh, Shredder does this weird... Um, charges up his energy, does this attack, and it fucks Batman up. He's like, that mother, it's not gonna happen again. I'm gonna find that guy. And then you have a scene where the turtles go up against Penguin and his men, and Penguin's in a very Saturday morning fashion, the way that whole battle goes out, goes down. And I want to say that they do a good job of Mikey presenting all the weird things about Gotham. It's like, okay, there's just blimps flying around everywhere. Why is there blimps? I think that's kind of cool. And look, He's got a guy who has an umbrella uh, with a gun, a gumbrella, and not only that, he can fly with it. I mean, that's kind of, he's, he's little. That's kind of cool, right? He's like totally like the fanboy of everything in Gotham. This is actually the other weird thing, because I want to say in the comic book, they go from like, it's like an interdimension thing. Like somehow, some way, they get thrown into Gotham. Where this one's like, shit, we're taking a road trip up to Gotham from New York. It's like, the fuck? So the Ninja Turtles have just been here in DC land this whole time? Yeah, I guess it's just, that's what they would do sometimes in old crossover comics. Because I remember I was just flipping through, I want to say it came across like a 80s Daredevil Batman comic one time. I was just flipping through it, and Batman swings in and hits Daredevil. It's like, what are you doing in Gotham City, Daredevil? You're stomping around Hell's Kitchen, New York. I'm like, oh, okay. So, it's one of those things where they used to do that, and now it's like, yeah, it's, it's different universes. We don't we don't bump shoulders with these guys. But I think this one, is just like, fuck that interdimensional shit. This is just some... I think it's meant to be some weird universe between both comics, where it's like, okay, this is where everything's kind of shared. Yeah, I and mean, that's what I'm kind of going with, too. And also, I think sometimes when you make, like, a standalone movie, you kind of want to simplify it, I think, for, like, just the average audience, because there is going to be the people who just come in and be like, oh, I'm just a Ninja Turtles fan, you know what I mean? I, I mean, I know who Batman is, but I don't know a whole lot about it. So they might, might want to throw it on and just watch it. And I think if you kind of start off being like, it's interdimensional, there's time travel, there's all this shit going on, it's kind of might throw, like, the just the regular Joe. who You know, it's, it's almost that thing, it's like, it's not really necessary to almost have that in there. I mean, I understand it, like, in a comic book, and they keep, the, like, that kind of continuity intact. But, you know what I mean? It's just a standalone, straightforward story that's already kind of in its own pocket universe. Totally fine. Yeah, and I think that the other thing about that is the interdimensional aspect, it gave some urgency for the turtles to get back because it was the whole Spider-Verse thing where it's just like, oh, if we stay here too long, our molecules will degenerate and we'll, like, die or whatever. So, and it was the same thing with the, it was, and that didn't happen in this. It was um, just like, oh, yeah, we were just passing through Gotham. We were trying to figure out what the foot was doing here. And it's just, it's pretty much a very straight, simple story. Just Shredder and Ray Jal Ghoul are working together and it's kind of like this trade-off thing where Rage has like okay um they're both kind of using each other they're planning to backstab each other at some point but Shredder wants a access to a Lazarus pit so he can gain immortality and Rage he's just playing him he's just waiting for him to fuck up so he can take over the remainder of the Foot Clan because I will say this. I mean, I haven't really read many. I haven't really, really read that many in, uh, Ninja Turtles comics. But Shredder, he seems to be more of a good fighter. He doesn't. See, he just kind of always seems to be a fuck up in the cartoons and these kind of things. Well, and it's also the weird thing too is like in the original comic books, Shredder's only in those first three issues, and then he dies like he does in the movie, and they don't ever fucking bring him back alive. I think they bear him back at one point as like 
he literally comes back as like worms and everything like this like he's brought back from like the earth in this weird kind of like mutant type way and then I said almost like you'd say like a zombie but beyond that though they like Shredder never really comes back in in those original Kevin Eastman and uh, Peter Laird books it's like he's and people can't let him die yeah and, it, and it's so fucking weird because in the show it's like he's there in every fucking episode and here's the thing about Shredder he's one of those he's like the Joker right? he's like a pure amazing villain like you really can't write a better character than that but at the same time there's always that point where it's like you know what maybe you don't need to always use the Joker. Maybe you don't always need to use Shredder. And Shredder's even worse than, like, the Joker. I mean, he's, like, literally in everything Ninja Turtles, practically. So it's always kind yeah. of nice whenever there's, like, a non-Shredder episode. Just to make Shredder kind of special, you know what I mean? I think that's the downfall. Is they kind of, like, they made Shredder not seem, like, as amazing as he should be by having him there a little too often. Whatever the next Ninja Turtles movie is, because I got a feeling they're not going to make number three. I got a feeling they're just going to reboot it. They, they might make a number three. But whatever they end up doing, I really hope they just don't use Shredder. I just hope they just wait for, like, the third movie, if that, for Shredder, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, that's what made number four so good. I guess number three didn't have a Shredder in it either, but um, is it, like, they kind of had this big movie, like, hey, we're not using Shredder, we're using other characters in here, and so on. And it's just kind of, it, it's nice, because the Turtles universe exists with so many characters. I mean, for this Batman versus Ninja Turtles thing... 100% fine they use Shredder and the Joker. I, I have no problem in, like, a crossover like this. I think it just when it comes to Ninja Turtles in general. And that's where I think that that TMNT t show was always, like, so dialed in because they didn't just, like, use Shredder on everything. They had all kinds of other characters in there. It was treated in sort of like a Batman the Animated Series style. You know, it's like... I've only seen a couple seasons of that one, but it's one of those ones where, like, you know... You always kind of hate to say it, but it's like that that is like I think the definitive Ninja Turtles show. I remember when it came out as a kid, I was like, "Not my fucking Ninja Turtles. Try to show me what I could like choose." I remember, I mean, I wasn't into it at the time cuz I was like in high school and I was just like, "I can't watch that. I'll be judged." And I probably watch it now and be like, "Oh, it's actually pretty good." Cuz that's right when like moving 90s and on is kind of a period where like, "You know what? Let's try and make this not only good for the kids, but also enjoyable for the parents enough to watch too." And also, a lot of people by then grew up on the original or some some effect like that. Um, or by that point, maybe not the original, but maybe people who grew up reading the 80s comics. So, um, moving from there, though, I think that I would like to see, like, more characters other than Shredder going on. But this movie right here, it does a good job of, like, cherry-picking. And I think as far as Turtles go, with the exception of Casey Jones and April O'Neil, who were in the original comic, yeah. and they came both... All they were there to do is like, guys, uh, you gotta come back over here. You're gonna die. Like, no, man, we gotta help the bat. Fuck the bat. Like, no, Casey, whatever. He just hops back in the wormhole and they come back at the end where this is just much more of a, it has, it has more of an emphasis on the turtles and then a handful of the villains. It has Baxter Stockman, which was, I was kind of surprised to see. Yeah. And then, um, Shredder himself. So. But it's kind of weird how, like, yeah, it's almost like. It's it's very heavy Batman. <laughs> of course, Batman. <laughs> of course, it's been very heavy Batman. How are you going to sell it? You're not going to sell it for Ninja Turtles. But um, I do kind of... That was like my only thing is I do kind of wish... I wish there was either a Casey Jones or an April O'Neil or even like a Crank. I felt like there, there was almost like some moments where you could have had a little bit more, I think, Ninja Turtles in there. It sounds weird to say that, but like it definitely like falls way harder on the Batman family than it does like the, the Ninja Turtles just happen to like show up in Gotham I mean maybe mm -hmm. by that standard you could do a sequel where instead Batman goes to New York yeah well there's also keep in mind this one is I can definitely tell it's pulling more from number one now, I never read Batman versus Batman Ninja Turtles volume two nor and I think volume three is still finishing up its run so I've never read two or three so maybe this pulled some elements from that possibly or maybe it's just more of just that stuff they're saving for a potential sequel i know that this the first one it was just batman on the batman side it was other than batman's villains and in gotham it was batman and robin where this one it's batman and robin and batgirl but i thought that was kind of interesting because each each character like good guy the batman family has someone to uh, play off of on the Joker, on, on, on the Joker, on the Turtle side. Batman and Leo kind of see eye to eye because originally in the comic it was Batman's there. They all think Batman's the most awesome guy in the world because you know Leo is just impressed on a fanboy. I mean, no, 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 Michelangelo's impressed on a fanboy level. Leo respects him as a martial artist 
and his sense of leadership. Donatello represent, uh, loves him as a scientist. And then Raph is just not impressed, you know. <laughs> and from there, you, it, it's kind of like, I love Raphael, but every, whenever they introduce him in something, he's always not impressed, man. Like, dude, you're going to go off. You're going to try and save, do things yourself. You're going to get your ass kicked, and then they got to bail you out. And he even acknowledges that in this movie. Yeah. And so I'm glad they don't do that. He says, here's what happens. This is what usually happens, and this is how I fuck it up. And I see that in you. And I thought that one, like, I'm really glad that it's, he, he said that and they didn't feel the need to do that. So what they do is Batman and Leo play off each other, Batgirl and Donatello. And Batgirl was voiced by uh, Rachel Bloom, which I thought was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And um, she was, uh, she was aside from being on, like, a sitcom, she was uh, Princess Peach in the Star Bomb Luigi's Ballad song. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, she was. She's like a. She's like. She's like a, com- a comedic uh, musician. So, um, yeah. So Donatello and Batgirl play off each other. Robin, Damien, and Raphael play off each other. Now that this one was funny, Michelangelo and Alfred play off each other. Just polar opposites, right there. And I just thought that kind of gave them all something to do, rather than all of them just like jerking off to Batman while. Raph likes, he's like, whatever, I'm stealing the car. (laughs) Well, I'm just jerking off because it's something to do to pass time. It's not that I'm I'm, impressed with Batman. I'm just jerking off out of boredom. I can do that. (laughs) Yeah, I just didn't want to to feel alone like how I normally do on a Saturday night. (laughs) When I'm up, like, you know, noir in it on the street. (laughs) And my trench coat. I mean, the, the, the trench coat and, and hat he's always wearing whenever they go out. Because in the cartoon, he he wore that in the um, in the cartoon, but in the movie when he's wearing it, he looks like he's in New York in the eighties. He looks like he's on his way to like uh, it's because it's before Giuliani's cleanup. He looks like he's on his way to like you know to like Times Square or whatever to go to a jerk off theater. <laughs> yeah, it really does. <laughs> oh. But really, this is the other part that really excels in this movie. I mean, because for this part, too, you kind of get to, like, awesome action. But, dude, the action scenes in this movie are, like, super dialed in. They're very well animated. Like, almost, like, more than almost any animated movie I've ever seen. Like, it is really impressive. Like, every single time there's action in it, like, they are, it's like a full-on martial arts flick. And it, like, they really almost, like, well thought it out. Can I, um, just pitch a theory nothing that i really actually put a whole lot of thought into just kind of thing off the top of my head go for it i think because you know the martial arts and action scenes in the dc universe movies are usually pretty good but i think that's the reason why this one's so good is i honestly think even though dc is still one of warner brothers biggest commodities they're still very apprehensive towards a lot of things so their animation department even though it's still going on I think they get a little like, uh, you only get so much money. The sales in the last movie didn't do so good, so we're going to just give you just a little bit less this time. I feel like since this is Ninja Turtles and DC, it's owned by Nickelodeon, I think like, you know what, let's not let's go all out and make this a longer movie and make the action scenes longer too. Yeah, it definitely felt like they doubled down on this one for sure. Like They knew that this one had a much higher selling point than anything else. I mean, shit, you combine Batman and Ninja Turtles, like... You've hit every 90s kid right there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I'll say that this thing does have some of the Saturday Saturday morning dynamics we said earlier. Kind of that whole, like, you know, we got the... We, we have this et- ooze mutagen that turns us into stuff, whatever. But then I think the writing itself is actually kind of clever. Like, a lot of the visuals seem Saturday morning-ish. But then the actual thing... Some of the dialogue between the characters is actually kind of clever. Like, especially between Donatello and Batgirl. I thought a lot of that was pretty good, even between like Raphael and and Robin, that was pretty good too. Well, there's even there's like there's some great just moments in this one. They're just I remember like like when they're getting ready to go on a case on Michelangelo goes to Batman. He's like, he's like, but what about all the pizza over there? And Batman's like, no time for pizza. And then Michelangelo just kind of starts cowering down, and Donatello runs by and starts rubbing his head and slowly feeding him pizza. <laughs> like it's okay. <laughs> that kind of thing. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, even like there's that kind of shit like Don like Michelangelo would say, and it's usually past the roll, like a, you know, kind of like them just rolling their eyes, go like, oh, Donnie or oh Mikey, whatever. But I think it still works in this one because there's the part where he's just like, like Donnie, you're 
Your arm's broken. Thank you, Mikey. I noticed. <laughs> Just kind of things like that. Well, there's even parts where, like, Mike, I remember, like, he's going off on this whole, like, he's got a whole whiteboard tangent going on, and he goes off, like, the whole thing, he's thinking of everything, and then everybody just turns after he goes on that whole speech and just goes back to exactly what they're doing, like, they just don't even pay attention to it. It's like, it's just Mikey doing what Mikey does, we're just gonna go back to this over here. And I think they did a good job of giving every character a moment. And they also elaborate and expand on certain things. Other than the kind of like each character having another character to play off of on the team, they they do a good job of like, oh, wait. Because uh, what happens in the comic is they go to Arkham Asylum because they're trying to get this this equipment so they can go back to their world. But they go they go to Arkham Asylum, and that's where Joker... Not Joker. Um, where um, where um, uh, Shredder Rage. and Rage... Yeah, Sh Shredder and Raish decide to put all the ooze onto all the different inmates in Arkham, and they all turn into, like, an animal counterpart, like all the Turtles villains do, and the Turtles themselves. And out of that, they end up just, like, having this big, cool fight. And from there, it, they just kind of, like, stomp it, and they save the day. And that's where it stops. But that's only, like, probably the... the like, the third act, or not maybe... Second act. The third act. Maybe the third act in a four-act movie, maybe. Well, you know, I'll just say this because you know that part is in the comic book, but it's almost like very short in the comic. Like it sort of happens for like maybe like a half of one issue or something like that. Well, it's like a big splash panel, and you see all the characters, and like you see one or two punches, and then it's taken care of because then it's mainly Rage fighting the turtles and Batman fighting Shredder. Yeah, but it's like in this one they really expanded on the fact that like all the Gotham inmates kind of turning into different monsters and so on. And plus, even like the one too, like when like Harley Quinn turns into like the hyena thing, like that, I don't know what it is, but like that one's like really creepy looking. Yeah, they do a good job of making that one scary. Like, the, like I, I don't know what it is, just the the Harley Quinn voice and the look, but like on this giant like cartoon hyena looking thing, I don't know. It's like that, that to me was like whoa. <laughs> With a constant grin. Like, they, they change with some of the characters' work. Some of the characters were different animals. And I'll be honest, I like some of the designs in the comic more. But some of them, I think, were better choices. Like, uh, like, like you know, Mr. Freeze turns into a polar bear. That makes sense. I thought his design in the comic was way cooler. But at the same time, it still makes for a really cool action scene. And then, instead of being a baboon, Two-Face turns into a cougar, which has two kind of faces splitting apart. And I thought it was kind of interesting because it was like the two faces are talking to each other right there rather than, you know, the just, you know, one guy saying like with two different voices. And that was kind of interesting. And then Bane, instead of turning into an elephant, turns into a jaguar. Mm -hmm. And Poison Ivy, instead of turning into a uh, praying mantis, turns into a giant plant. But I thought that was actually kind of funny because for a minute you're like, okay, so what's going to go happen? It's kind of a game of death thing. They're going to go to each level and fight a different one of these characters and... The fights were getting cool, were pretty cool, but right when a point when it felt like it was kind of going on maybe a little too long, that's when they come across Poison Ivy, and then she's just this plant, and she, like a giant Venus flytrap, and she tries to lunge at him, but she can't, because she's stuck and rooted in the ground. Like, um, I guess we just kind of move around her. Like, wait, no, no, just go into the other room, and <laughs> that's that. No, I, I like that, because I was like a perfect, like, like, yep, a little bit of humor right there, just kind of work, because yeah, she's stuck in the ground, you know, she can't, the, the, she's not moving. I thought that was just kind of funny, just because the idea of... you just That's like actually one of the last characters I thought they'd give the shaft to, right there. So, the fact they did it with her, I'm like, alright, alright, that was pretty clever. And that makes sense, actually. I think it was also a budgeting thing. Like, how many fucking fights do we need to put in this thing? I mean, we're gonna have these guys fight, uh, fight Freeze. We're gonna have these guys fight Two-Face. And then they still gotta deal with Joker and Harley. And then there's the big final battle. Like, let's just make Poison Ivy stuck to the ground. Yeah, exactly. I, I think I think it was a double way. I mean, but it like works really well. Mm -hmm. But then past that, I guess that's when you get to like the final fight scene where they're like, "We gotta go to like you know." Um, oh, well, we we skip the part where they inject they because like Joker oh, yeah. they get the, they utilize him more as like a cobra because he's like a cobra for a second and he's there and he says, "Hey, bats, look at me! I'm a snake now, whatever." But here they actually have a little bit more fight with him and that fight's a little bit more dragged out and they inject him with this mixture of his venom. Because if apparently if you mix that ooze, the ooze, with Joker toxin, it makes you like a crazy rabid animal. So they did that to Batman. He turns into a crazy man bat, essentially. And the turtles got to stop him. Yeah. So there's that really cool battle scene and so on and whatnot. And then, of course, uh, I think Donatello and Batgirl make the antidote that they're able to use on him. 
Mm-hmm. Well, there's even small things with their humor. Kind of like, like, the, the Batgirl's like, the thing's un- untested, so there's a 40% chance it's uh, lethal, but, you know, that's only a 40% chance. And then Donna, like, Le- Raph's like, why don't you stand, stand a little bit more that way? And, Ra- and Damien's like, I'm with the turtle. That direction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that leads us into, I guess, then it goes into um, the final battle, which is just a badass fight scene between generally like Leo and Ross, or Raish, and then um, you have Batman fighting Shredder. And I just like the way it kind of goes about because like Leo and Raish fight like a samurai battle because they almost they changed Leo up a bit in this one too. This, this is like one of those things if you just been watching Turtles instead of um. I can't remember what it's called, but, like, the martial arts style of ninjutsu that Leo has where you have the two swords instead. They switch him over to being, like, more of a samurai where he's got the two swords, like, katanas on his side. And that's how he's fighting instead. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a small touch, but it's almost kind of like, oh, you know what? Every once in a while, that's fine. Ch- change his martial arts style just a little bit. Why not? Yeah, yeah. And he's doing, I think by that point, he's like, okay, this is between you and me. There's no need for sneaking around. We're going to fucking do this. And... We'll just get this out of the way, because it jumps back and forth between what everybody's doing. This guy's fighting over here, this guy's fighting over there, these guys are trying to stop the bomb from going off. Uh, the Leo and Rage fight, I like that how it's like very intense, because for a while I want to say Donnie is fighting Rage, and then he ends up breaking Donnie's arm and kicking him over this thing. At some point, Leo got dosed with some Scarecrow gas and had this vision of all his brothers dying. And not just dying, dying like horrifically which is like okay that's where you get your pg-13 rating you know so yeah, um, like hard pg-13 too not just like a light pg-13 like mummified corpses being attacked by birds so and like his fl- arm is full on just floppy and dangling down and he goes and fights rage after he after he beats the shit out of leo after uh, donnie and i like how it's this very intense and it, it's even kind of shot sort of like a samurai movie slash the way Rage is fighting, he's fighting kind of um, like swashbuckling, kind of, because he has the one arm behind his back, the other arm out with the sword. Uh huh. Yeah, because he's got that kind of like where he he like he doesn't need the second arm type thing. Errol Flynn type of thing. Yeah, sort of like a fencing, but he's got like the um, God, what, what do you call those swords from the middle? The Arabian East? blade. I don't, I don't know what you call, it, but it's like that Arabian blade kind of thing. Yeah, but it's uh, got that style. And then, um, and then I guess it's cutting back and forth. I mean, you got like all kinds of other stuff because then there's a bunch of like the League assassins are turned into all kinds of animals, so they're battling like an elephant, and then one guy's like a T Rex and everything like that. And it's like I don't know what it is like the T Rex, the little ninja mask on. <laughs> there's something special that about that. <laughs> just like well, I, I was laughing, I was just laughing at the idea because they're doing this at the Ace Chemical Plants. That's where that whole battle is taking place at, and I was laughing. And it's, I'm not going to take it too seriously, because it's, it's only a cartoon. But there's a whole part when, like, she doesn't kill him. But Batgirl definitely leads an elephant man right to his death. Like, fuck him. Batman wasn't looking. <laughs> there's, there's a couple moments of that where, like, there's some, like, foot soldiers that, like, they just sort of, like, there's no, like, Batman, nobody else set him up for death. But they just totally go for it. And there's like, oh. Okay, that guy's totally dead. That guy did not survive. And these aren't, like, foot soldiers that are robots, like old-school Ninja Turtles. No, no, these are regular human ninja guys. Yeah, yeah, so that happens a few times, and they, I guess they never actually kill him, kill him. Maybe I think some of the turtles might do it, but, you know, they're, 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 they're not from Gotham, so they don't know the rules. But um, I just thought it was kind of funny how Batgirl had no remorse for, like, having, like leading this guy to his death. Like, whatever, yeah, fuck him. <laughs> I know. There is He's a... an elephant now. He's not a person. <laughs> he doesn't have rights. <laughs> Shit. Let's let's send his tusk to some let's send his tusk to some trophy hunter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean make some money Get so I can pay off so I can pay off my college loan. <laughs> Shit, this was planned. Mm-hmm. But um then they end up going and uh I what was it? Then, like, I thought it was kinda of funny the way and this seems kinda of like um a jokey kind of way to beat Rage, Rage, but I thought it worked. You know, Rage is all talking like, Child, I've been alive for th- for hundreds of years. Well, how long have you been around? Like, I'm 16. Don't I know what I do? This. And just flat out kicks him in the balls. <laughs> and then does, like, this, like, special move that, pl- that he talks about Splinter showing him later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just like, that, that is the kind of thing that's like... He's like, yeah, he's like, he goes with the whole bad guy monologue. And he's just like, well, I'm fucking 16. Fuck you, man. Kick you in the nuts. 
Let go of my purse. I don't know you. <laughs> I, like the, I like the going back to that King of the Hill episode just for a second where Bobby's just like, I don't know you. Just kicking him. I just, I like his kids are starting to get intimidated by Bobby. Like, who wants to mess with me now? Like, he's the only one that will go low enough to kick another man in the balls. Yeah, he's almost like becomes a bully because of it. <laughs> And then um, Batman well, has this battle with Shredder. When I, what I like about that one, too, is at first, like, Batman's kind of like, because he, he pretty much lost the last one, you know what I mean? You know, Shredder used that, like, you know, his, like, charge Hadouken thing on him, whatever. And then um, in this battle, Batman's trying to, like, he's trying to, like, level the odds by using all his gadgets. He's throwing all kinds of stuff, and there's a point where Shredder literally takes the claws. He's like, no more gadgets, no more weapons. You fight fairly now, even though I just used my claws to rip your, gadget, to rip your belt off. Batman just like, I like how he goes like, I'm the goddamn Batman, I don't need no fucking bad toys, be your ass, I'm just having fun! <laughs> just gonna, I'm gonna use my the old fashioned southern whooping style. So my dad taught me, <laughs> with his belt. I'll take my utility belt off, I don't need it for any of the gadgets inside, I'm just gonna use it as a fucking weapon. So from there, he ends up beating the shit out of Shredder, as you expect. And then Shredder ends up going straight into the acid, which leads to a post credit sequence where he's, like, a Shredder Joker. Yeah, well, that also makes me kind of wonder if, like, will there be a Batman TMNT 2? Because by that standard, I guess you really could kind of, like, go for that and then make it... Then you could fit in Casey Jones and April and Splinter, because it's kind of like all, all like the big, like, other than the Turtles characters are, like, not in there. Mm hmm Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, the only Turtles characters you have is the Turtles. Shredder. Um, I, Shredder. Stockman. Uh, Baxter Stockman. And the Foot, if you want to count them as one. So, yeah. yeah. And I guess it's kind of that thing where, like, I could see, like, if there was a sequel, instead of having maybe Batgirl and Damien and Alfred, you would replace those with Splinter, April, and uh, Casey Jones. You know what I mean? Really, at the end of the day. If that's... they were there, though, if they were there, I can guarantee, a, a, like, a, maybe not a huge plot point. But a passing love triangle between Batgirl, Casey Jones, and Nightwing. Yeah, you can see something like that too, or even like Batgirl, Casey Jones, and um, I felt like I had something where else April. I was going. April, yeah, there we go. That that's what I was like, just to connect those characters together. Since I, I assume Nightwing's kind of not really a part of this one. I mean, I guess I could bring him into it too, but felt well, like. What's well, they acknowledge that he's part of the world, kind of, because as you watch the credits, what I thought was interesting is they take a bunch of different... Because uh, what ends up happening at the end of the day is it's kind of what you expect. Like, we did it! Let's all have some pizza! And even Batman, he's like, it's pizza. Like, it's almost kind of a strain to say that. And when he eats it, though, he eats it very strategically. Like, it's a shot of him bending it slowly put it in his mouth and chewing it like very properly you know <laughs> well that's what i like about because you you never see like because that's like a lot of times how you kind of eat pizza is by bending it so that like it kind of goes nicely and doesn't fold on over and i've never and it sounds weird i've never seen it animated like that before because pizza's always like someone's holding it up and it's like dripping down you know what i mean it almost looks more disgusting it, like makes you sort of sometimes not want pizza when you see pizza in like cartoons but, like, the way that Batman eats mm -hmm. is, like, that's how you eat pizza. Fucking Batman knows. You know what I mean? Like, he's almost an expert without, like, saying he's an expert. This is the one thing I thought was kind of weird, though. I felt like the pizza was a perfect, like, reference to make, like, a Teen Titans joke, and they never made that in there. Be like, I just see Batman be like, oh, it's like a fucking Teen Titans party. I could see something like that, or even something like Alfred saying. Like, he says, like, I'm willing to cook them a three-course gourmet meal, and they want pizza. Fucking teenagers. And then they have that, but then they when it goes after the when they're showing the credits though, what what I liked about it is throughout the credits they have these different famous comic covers from both Batman and Ninja Turtles, but the characters kind of slid in there. So if it's a nineteen forties Batman cover, they somehow managed to get a turtle on there in a nineteen forties style. And there's one on there of like Michelangelo versus Nightwing. It was in like a, it was of a Turtles cover that I've seen before. Yeah, well, it, it, I think it was Raphael um, and Nightwing because Raphael was in like the, like the Streetwalker Noir costume. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah, because yeah, I remember and they so, had, they had that kind of dark cover, and that's what I liked. It kind of not only did it have Batman and Ninja Turtles covers, but it also had even like other ones too. There was like Justice League Justice covers, League. and there was Superman covers, and so on. I thought that was, that in itself was just a neat little touch to the very end. 
Yeah, I kind of gave you a reason to kind of watch through the credits without just having to wait for um, the uh, fast forwarding for uh, credit sequence or something like that. Yeah. No, I mean, like, overall, that was just all cool. And really, this is one of those ones, like, this one of those movies that was, like, it was pretty darn dialed in. Like, I think in, like, the last while, this has been one of the best kind of uh, DCU movies. Because I, I will say, like, seems like, don't get me wrong, I've, I've enjoyed some of the last couple ones that came out, but, like, I felt like it's been kind of a while since we've had, like, one that was like, oh, dude, this one's really fucking awesome, you know? They've been kind of the mixed match between good and just kind of, like, some of the kind of, like, you know, like, okay ones, you know, like Batman Ninja or whatever the fuck that was. Batman Ninja or Batman Fatal Five. Or Batman Fatal, uh, Just Sleep Fatal Five. Yeah, like that that one, too. That was, like, we, we had just a couple, like, okay DCU movies, so I'm kind of glad this finally kind of brought us back. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, yeah, th- this one, I'm not sure if they're counting this. This seems kind of like something in the ballpark of, like, their, uh, even though it's PG-13, it seems like something more in the ballpark of their uh, Batman meets Scooby-Doo, just because it, they don't really advertise it as much, and it kind of snook up kind of out of nowhere. I didn't really see a whole lot of advertisements for it beforehand, so, but I'm glad it came out, because this one was really fun. Yeah, I don't know why, sometimes, like, I don't get that why they don't advertise some of the movies, like, as much as the other ones, you know what I mean? Like, this one feels like, I mean, I think it kind of, the word of mouth sort of spread this one around pretty well, but beyond that, though, yeah, it's like, they'll advertise some movies, like, the living daylights out of, and then some movies, it's just kind of like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, by the way, a Vixen movie came out, I I guess if you care, it's just like, you know, here's the thing, the audience that buys these DCU movies, I think, wants them all at the end of the day, or at least wants to see them all. You could advertise to those guys every single time at the end. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's so weird that, like, I have to stumble across some of these movies myself without you advertising them. The next one, the next official DCEU one, that's Batman Hush, right? Yeah, I think so. Unless there's an in-between. There might... Nowadays, it seems like there's so many in-between movies, so I'm never too sure. But, um, yeah, Hush seems to be the... Because they've advertised that one twice, not only on this on the TMT movie, but they advertise it on the Fatal Five one as well, too. So you know that they're going to town on Hush, which would be amazing. Well, what's, what sounds smart about Hush is, even though it's set in that continual DC universe, I think sometimes it's kind of interesting to do that because I feel like I know Hush pretty well. So I think kind of mixing it up a little bit, like, okay, bring in these other elements, like Damien is a part of the story. So that's kind of interesting. That's kind of different, you know? So it's going to maybe throw me a few curveballs in some different areas. Yeah, well, I guess it's kind of the interesting thing to do. It's like, oh, I guess it is kind of like after Batman Bad Blood. So this is our next Batman one. Instead of doing it kind of like I... Because at first I thought it was a standalone one, but then it's like, oh, no, it is. looks like it's going to be in the Batman, like, continual section. And I'm kind of wondering how they're going to do Jason Todd. Maybe they may just leave that whole plot point out. But I'm wondering how, if they're going to do um, Clayface as Jason Todd at some point. Yeah, because that, cause that's kind of an interesting one, too, because Jason Todd's, I don't think, has ever been in those ones yet. Yet that's, like, such a, a huge moment. I mean, maybe that's more of a huge moment for the time period. Maybe as far mm-hmm. as the story goes, I guess, nowadays, and maybe it won't be nearly as, like, mind-blowing as it once was. I'm not too sure. I'm not entirely sure if the DC Continual Universe movies, I'm not sure if those ones are part of the same world as... Um, Young Justice. At one point, I didn't think they were, but then I noticed some. I just saw some clips of the newer season, and the character models. Some of the character models look the same. So I'm not entirely sure if it's one of those things they retroactively like. Yeah, they, they just kind of change over the years. So this is what it is now. So I'm kind of wondering. And in that universe, they mention Jason Todd. But they jump a couple of years later, and he's dead. So. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've, I've always kind of wondered if they're going to ever connect that together or if they're just going to leave that sort of separate. You mm-hmm. know, that, that that's a weird one. But, um, but yeah, I, I know there's all sorts of... I think there's also even another Wonder Woman movie they're doing, too, coming out this year. I want to say. Really? Another Wonder Woman one? I remember one time when I was looking at, like, when the, the Batman TMT movie was coming out on Amazon, it was like, oh, shit, there's another Wonder Woman movie, and then, of course, there's some other Justice League movie, probably, of course, and so on, but, um... Yeah, they're actually going to do another, like, standalone Wonder Woman one. I'm like, that's pretty badass. Well, I think now it's like, you know what? Wonder Woman wrecked shop at the box office, and now they're coming out with Wonder Woman 2 or Wonder Woman 84, and people are dying for that. So I think that they'll be like, okay, let's give this another shot. Oh, I guess, I guess that may, that that's the reason why there's a Wonder Woman one coming out. It's kind of like when they did the Green Lantern First Flight. They're like, oh, we got a movie coming out here. Here's an animated movie. You always kind of forget. They like, they like to pump it up a little bit more than you think, but... 
Mm-hmm. But yeah, Batman TMNT, I think that's definitely like one of the like the total must watches of these DCU ones. Like maybe not pure perfect, but damn is it good. You know, what I mean, it still has great action and amazing action scenes if anything. If anything, that's like the takeaway. But to top it off, it's just it's just a fu- it's just a fun movie, you know what I mean? It's one of those ones that you could totally like if somebody was coming on over and you knew that they liked either Batman or Ninja Turtles, it'd be like, "Hey, let's throw this on." It'll be if, if anything, it'll be a good like hangout party movie. I uh, I feel bad. I, there's there's the dude who we, we were on via VHS, and uh, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank on the dude's name, but he he loved Ninja Turtles a lot. He's a really funny guy too. Um, was it James? Was that his John? name or um, John? I think it was John because he loved. I remember he really liked Batman. And he loved Ninja Turtles. So I'm curious to know what he thinks of this movie. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see because that was like his number one pick for the '90s. So, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm logged out of my I'm locked out of my Twitter because I got a new phone. I'm like, fuck, what's my password? So it's me a minute before I find out any of that shit. But um, but yeah, no, this is one of those ones like definitely as far as like a Ninja Turtles movie goes, it's definitely like up there for sure. You know, though I guess it is more Batman than it is anything else. It just happens to have Ninja Turtles in it. But um, yeah, overall, I'm super impressed. I can't wait for Hush, of course, because that's gonna be just. Dude, that's the best Batman story you could possibly have. You know, from that point that's on. That's one of my favorite Batman books of all time. You know, we, we, we talked about it before on the podcast. So, you know, I mean, we'll talk about it again. So I can't wait for that one. But um, so many good things. We're at that fantastic point of the year where there's just like movies galore coming out. So nothing but good times. But till then, make sure to check out oldmanorange.com for more comics, podcasts, music, videos, all that fun stuff. Check out Pizza Boys. That's Pizza Boys of a Z comic book on there. And everything like that. And um, I'm Spencer Scott Holmes. And I'm Ryan Dunnigan. And we'll see you some other time. Later, folks. Thanks again for listening to the Old Man Orange Podcast. Sure, check out oldmanorange.com for more podcasts, cartoons, music, animation, and a whole lot more. We also have the Old Man Orange blog going with all kinds of fun stuff. If you easily want to support the show, use one of our Amazon links either on the website or in the description of the podcast below. Rate, review, and subscribe to the show either on Podbean, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Newgrounds, or anywhere else that you seem to get this podcast from. Grab the sitcom-styled comic book Pizza Boys on either Comic Central, Comixology, or Amazon. Want more podcasts? Check out the Indie Comics Club over at Comic Central. I also got a workout website called Thor's Hidden Gym. Filled with fitness tips and tricks, videos, and a whole lot more fun stuff in the calisthenics world. Talk to us on Twitter, at Spencer S. Holmes and Dunnigan Ryan. Like our Facebook pages of Old Man Orange Productions and Pizza Boys Comic. Thanks again, and we're out of here.